Hey y'all, it's Monday. I know we don't usually hang out at this time in this place, but we are gonna solve some exam one problems. So hopefully you guys start showing up here pretty soon. Um, the, if you are looking on Canvas for the six problems that I'm gonna work on today, you can find those in the collaborative problem solving session module. Um, I think they're called exam one review, CPPS worksheet. There's only six, you can do them later if you want to. Um, I'm sorry, they're a little late today. I just, you know what, I lost track of time. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, that's today. So here they are, they're available. We will do them the usual way, kind of up here at the top of the board, and then we'll solve those. So um, hopefully you guys are okay seeing, I'm excited to see you guys on Monday. I miss seeing my students two days a week but one day a week is better than none. If you guys have questions, you can, as always, drop them in the chat. You can also say howdy, as David did, so I'm glad you're here. Hopefully things are going well. I think, well, we'll give people a few more minutes. Again, if you have a question, drop it in the chat. If you don't, Oh, Sky, you're right. Hold on, let me write that down. So, Sky asked, um, are the answer keys going to be uploaded before Wednesday for all of the worksheets? Yes. Um, I just... Like everything else, I meant to have them up before this, and I'm not quite sure that I can navigate that at the same time as this. It likely will crash my computer. So I made a note. I will do that as soon as I get back to my office. If you don't see them up in the next, like by 5 o'clock, please send me another email and just nicely remind me that, like, hey, you said you would do this and you totally forgot. Um, I will happily upload those. Paxton said, you didn't know we have class. We don't. It's just a review. So there is no new material today. This is just six questions that are topics that I think students have a hard time with. Um, it's just a review session. So if you're like, I don't know how to X, Y, Z, we can work on that kind of stuff. If no one has any questions, then we'll hang out while we have questions to work and then move along. We got a few other hellos. So does anyone have any other questions before we get started on... Number one, make sure I turn my phone off. And today I brought a calculator so that I can answer questions. Salma asks, how many questions are gonna be on the exam? If you don't mind me asking. I don't mind you asking, but I won't. So there's two things with that. One, the number of questions on the exam doesn't tell you anything about the length. Um, but I've been working on it. It's not yet done. There are probably between 20 and 30 questions. So 20 to 30, some number of those. Keep in mind that a lot of times my questions have like A, B, C, D. So those are a little bit weird. So we have two people who are saying that Alex is giving them the maximum minimum questions. I don't know what those are either, but oh, are those questions that you guys are asking on Alex, things where they ask like, what is the minimum amount of product? What is the maximum amount of product that's left over? Um, Scott asks about two minutes a question. Mm, it's hard to say you have 75 minutes. It should take you as long as it takes you to answer that question. So it will be very unequal. If the question asks something short and simple, it will take that. Uh, in the information about the exam, it will give you more, like when you open up, it will tell you that. Okay. Ooh, five hours on Alex, I'm so sorry.
Okay. I think Alex is using different vocabulary words when they talk about the minimum and maximum amount of product. Now, I'm not a thousand percent. Yes, you can ask example questions. I will get back to those first. I will answer the minimum and maximum yields. Um, so, minimum yield, maximum yield. They're really asking very similar questions. So they both have to do with the limiting reactant. They just change what they're asking about. So the minimum yield, usually they don't ask about the minimum yield. Usually they say, what is the maximum yield? Which is how much you would get with the limiting reactant. When it asks about the minimum, I think it usually asks about, it's asking about the excess reagent. But I will look up some questions. There will probably not be something worded that way on the exam, but I will double check. Um, keep in mind, all this week is open pie. So if you have Alex objectives that you did not complete, you're like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Um, you can work on them this week. You can come to my office hours on Wednesday from 1 to 2 or Friday morning from 10 to 12, although it will be after the exam, so no one's going to think about chemistry. But you can come to either of those, and I can help you with that. So Billy says, for the Alex percent yield is a little different, so the rounding is a bit off. I'll look into that. Because I wonder if they're asking you to do something in a different way that I think about. OK. So Ms. J asks, for example, questions confused on how to balance an equation with H and OH on one side and water on the other side. Can you do an example problem? Sure. So, so if we have phosphoric acid plus magnesium hydroxide, that gives us water, H2O, and magnesium phosphate, which is magnesium, so plus two charge. So magnesium is a two plus, and phosphate is a three minus. So we need three magnesiums with, that's not very pretty, two phosphates. Um, so from here, how do we balance this equation? So I like to write down everything. So over here, every element splits basically into two things. So we're going to have H, and there's three of those, and there's a single PO4. Here we have magnesium, and then we have OH, and there are two of these. Now. You can also split this up into an O and an H and put some of the H's here. You can do that. Over here, we're going to have H2, PO4, 2, Mg3, and OH1. So when we think about this, the question is how do we balance those? So when we think about how to balance this, H2O, and we're going to learn this in the next chapter. So this is going to make a lot more sense right after this. So when we think about OH and H, it turns out that water in this case is H plus OH. Now, we haven't talked about how this happens, but you can trust me that this will make sense in approximately a week, maybe a week and 10 days, or a week to 10 days. But you can set it up the other way, to where we have an H and an O, and you just do them this way, as long as you leave the oxygens associated with the phosphorite of the phosphate together. So in this case, in order to set this up, we're going to start by balancing our reactant side. So we're going to start with the magnesium. We're going to drop a 3 here, because there are three magnesiums. 
And then we're going to need at least two phosphates. So we'll put a two here. So we're going to have six, two, three, six. So these numbers look okay. So our phosphates and our magnesiums balance, but then we can put a six here, which will give us six and six. You can also go back in and say there are six hydrogens here. Ooh, this is backwards. So there should be one here and one here. So then it would be six and six. Sorry about that. Okay. Limiting reactant questions. I got a good one. I have an acceptable one of those. Um, Amina, welcome today. We didn't talk a lot about the exam. No one's asked any big questions. This is just a review session. So glad you're here. Um, we have a request from several people that's been upvoted for a... I wouldn't have put that in the most exciting category. Oh, that is like way too small font. Actually, before I change that, can you read the font as is? Like not when my face is behind it? Um, because I don't quite know. And if not, we'll adjust the font size and show different parts of the question. So if you've pulled up the worksheet, then this is number five. So perfect. This is going to make my life easier. I was afraid that it was like super tiny font. So what I have for you guys today, this is an all-inclusive question. So as you can see here, there are four different questions. This is, it's adapted from an old exam question. So it wasn't asked like this, it is just similar to this. So we have a chemical equation where ammonium phosphate plus lead three nitrate, nitrate yields lead phosphate plus um, ammonium nitrate. Now we need to balance that. So If we have NH, or I'm going to leave off the states and can't see that. Just for space. And this yields, good, we're still looking good, lead phosphate plus NH for NO3. Now, in this case, put that over just a little bit. So in this equation, it's a little bit easier to imagine that each of these breaks into two parts. You can basically just draw a line between the anion and the cation. So when we do that, there's definitely only four things to balance. So we're going to start with our ammonia. We have a phosphate group. There's one of those. One lead. And there are three nitrates. Now over here, we have NH4. We only have one of those. We have one phosphate group. We have one lead group. And we have only one nitrate group. So it turns out that the things that are imbalanced are the ammonia and the nitrate, which are both three on this side and one on the other side. So we can add a singular coefficient right here. And so now we have a balanced chemical equation of 
one mole of ammonium phosphate plus one mole of lead three nitrate yields one mole of lead three phosphate and three moles of ammonium nitrate. So when we do this, we now have a balanced chemical equation. So I'm going to erase this part. And then we're going to solve part B. So Paxton asked, on the exam, will we have to put that states whatever they are? Yes. When you rewrite the fully balanced equation, you should include the states. You will include them if you have them. If you don't have them, don't worry about it. Um, so sometimes it will say, like, in this equation with states, in this equation without. If you have them, keep them. If you don't know them, don't go on. Good question. So the next question reads... Um, before we read that, so Nicole asks, if we have to put the states for the exam, are we required to include the states throughout the calculation shown as well? The states, so Nicole, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Are you asking, do you have to write, like in part B, we're asking how many grams of lead phosphate will be produced if you begin with 7.5? 865 grams of ammonium phosphate. Are you asking if we need to say 7.865 grams of NH43PO4? Or are you asking if the solid needs or the aqueous needs to come with it here? If you're asking, does it need to say aqueous here? No. The states really are only important for the balanced chemical equation. During this part of the problem, they are just a fine detail that are not necessarily helpful. So Sky asked, how do we determine the states for the equations, product and reactions? So one way that you would find out the states is if you can, it would be in the problem. So it would say, like, solid ammonium phosphate was dissolved into aqueous lead nitrate. The products were this. So in that case, so you can do that. Um, if it doesn't tell you, if it just says balance this equation with no states, there are no states that you can. Thank you for answering that, Ms. J. Oh, good. Lots of questions. So if you guys are confused about the exam, I tried to make a really detailed announcement on Monday. So please read that. Please make sure you look for all of the information. I am happy to answer questions. It is open notes. It is not open other humans or open other internet resources. It is your notes and your notes only. But it's open notes and open book. Just not other humans or other answering websites. If you have questions about that, send me an email. So I think, did I answer all of those questions? I might have gotten distracted. Oh, I think Nicole. Good. I answered both of your questions. Fantastic. Okay, so let's work on part B. So in part B, we have 7.865 grams of ammonium phosphate, and it asks us to determine how many grams of lead phosphate would show up. So from here, we are going to convert from grams to moles, moles to moles, and then moles to grams. These are the longest calculations that we've seen to date. There are a few other long ones coming at the end of the semester, but these are pretty much it. 
So how do we convert from grams to moles? We're going to use the molecular weight. <coughs> so the molecular weight of ammonium phosphate is 149.12 grams in one mole of ammonium phosphate. So in one, then we're going to convert to moles in one mole of ammonium oops, phosphate. There is one mole of lead phosphate. And then in one mole of lead phosphate, the molecular weight of that is 302.5. 17 grams of lead phosphate. So, make sure there aren't any new questions. We're good. So, molecular weights, or this conversion, grams to moles, comes directly from your periodic table. So, if you have a copy of the periodic table, which I would advocate, also if you don't have a printer, there is going to be one embedded in the exam. So, like, you don't have to go to Kinko's tonight to copy, make a copy. So, in this case, to create or determine the molecular weight of this, we're going to total up all of the elements. So, there are three nitrogen, there are 12 hydrogen, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. When we total up all of the molecular weights out of the periodic table, you will get 149.12 grams. So when we plug this into our calculator, provided I did it well, which we'll find out, is 15.94 grams of lead phosphate. So what questions do we have? Also, did I do all my math right? I, I tried to double check. So this isn't a limiting reactant question. The, uh, the next one is the limiting reactant question, but this is, in my opinion, an important skill building set. Can we convert product reactant to product, reactant to reactant? All of them use the same conversion of grams to moles. Moles to moles. and moles to grams. Now the other thing I understand with a lot of students is they get kind of lost in this equation. So when I see students get lost, one of the things I've noticed is they leave out all of these parts, like the grams of ammonium phosphate, they just put grams. But grams of what? What does it do? What does it look like? So I always try to write all this stuff out. I know it takes a long time. So sometimes like for ammonium phosphate, I might have just written AP in my own notes. So, but don't forget, you need to show all of your work and you'll upload that in order to get partial credit. Because Canvas is only gonna grade this. And it will only take whatever it is that's put in there. So, if you make a mistake, if Canvas has a meltdown, I grade all of the rest of your work. Your work must match your answer. So do we have any questions before we get to the probably more exciting limiting reactant part. Questions. Oh, we got the same answer. So, so Hara asks, when you say partial credit, how many points will you take away if we make a small mistake that changes the whole answer? 
I don't know. So my goal, this is my personal philosophy, is that you should earn as much credit for things that you know. So if it's a problem, and this is kind of hard to think about in abstract sense, right? So if you get, if you had all of those numbers in your work and somehow you just inputted the wrong answer, you would get partial credit for that. You could lose some percentage of the points, probably less than half, because it looks like you did most of the work. If you had done all of that work, but picked ammonium nitrate instead of the lead phosphate, like it asked in the problem, you would lose more points, even though you did something correct. So it is my philosophy, this is my philosophy, that you should earn as many points as possible. I like partial credit, both as a student, because I like to be rewarded for what I know and not rewarded for what I don't know. I also don't like exams where it feels like all or nothing. Things that are more all or nothing, naming. It's really hard to give partial credit. Now, if it's something like, like this example. So if this, it asks you to name the reactants and the products. So if you call this ammonia, not ammonium. Yeah, I think, yeah. If you call it ammonia phosphate, well, that's probably partial credit because you got the phosphate, right? But if you call this, I don't know, like pickle juice, which is obviously not correct, then you would receive no credits, even though the P, there is a P in pickle and in phosphate. So partial credit is meant to be advantageous. Um, I don't know, it really depends on what type of errors as to how much credit you'll lose. So sig figs are worth two points. So if you get those wrong, you'll lose two points with the SF annotation. If you, if I can tell that your work is correct and your map, like somehow your calculator went wrong, it's another two points. So hopefully that makes you feel better about partial credit. One minute. So in part C, which is our next calculation, it asks, if you begin the reaction with 12.02 grams of each reactant, how much of each is left at the end of the reaction? So Alex doesn't ask it exactly this way, and I will try to look up their words this afternoon and make sure that I'm using something similar uh, when I think about it. But in this case, we started with 12.02 grams of ammonium phosphate and 12.02 grams of lead nitrate. Which, what this is asking is who's the limiting reactant, who's the excess, and how much is left over of each. So we're going to start with our 12.02 grams of ammonium phosphate. So we're going to use the molecular weight of 149.12 grams in one mole of NH43PO4. Now, this is acting about reactant to reactant. So I'm going to convert the amount of ammonium phosphate into lead nitrate. So there's one mole of NH43PO4 and what? one mole of PbNO3-3, and then one mole of lead nitrate. There is 393.23 grams of lead nitrate. So when you plug this into your calculator, you get 31.67 grams of lead 3 
nitrate. So this tells you that the 12.02 grams of ammonium nitrate requires 31 and some change grams of lead nitrate. So the thing is, when we do this, what we know is that this is going to be the limiting reaction because we do not have this much of that. So we know that the ammonium phosphate will become our excess reagent. Okay, we have some questions. Just put the coefficients. So Abby, or Abby, um, you stated you find it easier to just put the coefficients in front of the reactants and products and not write them off to the side because it's what I'm used to doing. Um, I, to be quite honest, cannot quite picture what it is you're asking, um, mostly because I can't see your piece of paper. If you were asking what I had done way over here, that was to calculate the molar mass. Um, you will get points off if you don't show all your work. Sky asks, you do a different way of balancing equations. That's okay. I am showing you my way. If you go to SI, Megan may teach you guys slightly different ways. But if I can follow your work, then you, you will get full credit. If you wrote this, you will not get full credit. And you might be like, I don't even know what all that is. You basically took out all of the coefficients. You took out a lot here. So you will not get full credit. So, no, it's totally okay. You need to show enough work that I can figure out your answer. So if you show this and you get the right answer, it's easy for me to give you credit. If you show this and something is wrong, it is much harder for me to give you partial credit. Y'all, you just need to show some work. There just has to be some work. Don't panic about how much work it is. You just need to show some work. You can, I balance in my head. You don't need to show all that work. You just need to show some work. It doesn't have to be as detailed as my work is on here. This is so that later you can learn. So if by chance on this question, what about if you had chosen to start with the lead nitrate instead of the ammonium phosphate? So in this case, you would write out a very similar equation of 393.23 grams of lead nitrate, one mole, PbNO3, three, in one mole, the PbNO3, three, there's one mole of uh, ammonia, ammonium nitrate, in one mole of NH4, Three PO4, there's 149.12 grams. And this gives you, when you plug it into your calculator, 4.554 grams of NH4, 3 PO4. Okay, so if you had chosen this one first, you would not need to show any of this work in order to answer the question. So Sometimes you get lucky and you only have to do one. You are not required to show this work. I like to show as many different ways as possible to give you guys the chance. So in this case, once we solve this, this tells us that the lead nitrate is our limiting reactant. So there are zero grams of PbNO3 left. And we're going to write over here, for the ammonium nitrate, we're going to have started with 12.02 grams minus 4.554 grams. And that gives you 
7.756 grams with sig figs because we need to remember subtraction so we only get two decimal points and we will get 7.46 grams left. So Alex probably asked you, what is the minimum amount of something that remains? So the minimum amount, Alex will ask, what is the minimum remaining or what is the maximum re remaining? That's just basically asking these type of questions in a different way. So, Ling Yang, I think, I'm not, I am probably said that wrong, I'm so sorry, asked on that brown periodic table, the mass has many decimals, very true. How many decimals should we use on the exam? I will always use two on anything that comes from the periodic table. So I've noticed a lot of you are using anything out of the periodic table in the videos and in here, I've always talked about just trim it back to two. It may make it something different. Yes, Cassidy, that is the ammonium phosphate leftover, the 7.46. Sorry about that. Other questions? Ms. J, you were correct that this, the 7.46 is the ammonium phosphate leftover that came from the 12.02 starting material minus the 4.554 grams that we used in order to consume all of the lead nitrate. Oh, y'all are killing me here. Okay. I'm going to give you guys a second. So what questions do we have? Or if you have none, you can write none in the box. So Ms. J says she got confused and thought it was the theoretical. So neither, so far in part C, we haven't actually calculated how much product will be made. So you'll note that PBNO33 is the other reactant and ammonium phosphate is the other reactant. So in part D, we are gonna talk about the theoretical yield. But thus far, we've only talked about the reactant parts. Nice. So it looks like we're all processing along. Um, I like questions like this, where it kind of steps you through the calculations. So one of the things I've noticed Alex does is it will just ask you like part D as the whole question. I like to be like, please balance the equation. How many grams of this? How many grams of this? So make sure that you're answering what I'm asking at any given point. So in part D, it says if we only collect six point. 981 grams of ammonium nitrate at the end of the reaction, what is your percent yield? So I'm going to erase the board because I wrote all of it. So in our next calculation, so the thing to remember is that C and D are coupled because it's after this reaction where we start with 12.02 grams of each. So we're going to start with our limiting reactant, which is the lead nitrate. So we're going to start with the 12.02 grams of lead 3 nitrate 
and convert that into moles. So there are 393.23 grams and one mole of lead nitrate. And one mole or one mole of lead nitrate gives me three moles of NH4 and a three and one mole of NH4 and O3, it's 80.06 grams. When you plug this in, you should get 7.342 grams of NH4 and O3 as your theoretical yield. Oh, so Ms. J, Zahara is t correct. It has to do with the two decimal places that come from the 12.02 in the significant figures. So Ms. J is asking, oh, never mind. We're good to go. So once we were able to calculate our theoretical yield, So the theoretical yield in this case uses our limiting reactant. You could have also used the amount of the 4.556 grams of ammonium phosphate. Just stick with this. So now we have a theoretical yield. Percent yield is actual divided by theoretical multiplied by 100. And when we do this, you should get 95.08% yield. A couple of you have mentioned that Alex is having you do this calculation slightly differently. Um, I am going to take a peek into that. If something wild and crazy is happening in Alex, I will adjust the answer keys for the exam accordingly so that you can do it both the way. I have taught it because this is how I teach it, and I will accept if Alex is doing something crazy. If Alex is just doing a different mechanism, this should get you to the right answer. So, in this case, we were able to calculate our theoretical yield, and it's always important to remember the actual has to come out of the problem. You can't figure out the actual yield just kind of like making, like it doesn't just arrive to you. So what questions do we have about calculating actual yield, percent yield, or theoretical yield? So Cassidy asked, what was our actual yield? In the problem, it says you only collect 6.981 grams. So I will write this out. 6.981 grams divided by 7.342 grams multiplied by 100 gives you 95.08. Other questions? If you don't have any questions, go ahead and put none. Um, the next, or you can vote. So the other two questions that I think are not exciting, I think we should either do an empirical formula or the atomic mass calculation using the isotopes. So we can either do atomic mass calculation or empirical So you guys can pick between those while I answer questions and erase the board. We have one of each of those. Hopefully we'll get through both. Um, it's okay. This question takes the longest. Limiting reactant is the hardest, in my opinion. I feel like some of the other ones kind of lead up to that and build into that. So, so far we have... Oh. 
oh, Zahara and Miss J, we're going to try to do both. I will try. I will stay here until we finish both of those. How's that? Okay. It looks like we're getting a lot of empiricals. Oh, it looks like it's tied. So in that case, we will do the empirical first. Then we will do the atomic mass calculation. But I will stay here and do both just because I love you guys. I'll keep changing your minds. Okay. So, I will erase the board. If you want to read the question, it states, can't read it. A scientist collects a new sample and determined that it was 45.16% potassium, 17.88% phosphorus, and 36.96% oxygen by, math, by mass. If the molecular weight is 520 atomic mass units, what is the molecular formula? So, If we finish all of these, no, I will not post a key. If I don't, I will post a key for the ones we don't do. So for number six, um, in this case, the empirical formula, we want to start with our first step. Step one is the 100 gram assumption. So the 100 gram assumption basically tells us that we can assume that these percentages are out of 100 grams. Therefore, for our potassium, it is 45.16 grams of potassium. Make sure I get the numbers right. For phosphorus, it will be 17.88 grams of phosphorus. For oxygen, there are 36.96 grams of oxygen. This is step one. Step one, assume that we have 100 grams. Step two is convert to moles. So we're going to take the molar mass directly out of the periodic table, which is 39.10 grams in one mole of potassium, which gives us 1.155 moles of potassium. For phosphorus, it is 30.97 grams in one mole of phosphorus, which gives us 0 0.577 moles of phosphorus. For oxygen, we're going to divide by our 16.00 grams in one mole of oxygen, and that should give you 2.31 moles of oxygen. Now, Step one, assume 100 grams. Step two, convert to moles. Step three is probably the trickiest. It's divide by the least moles. So none of these are whole round numbers. But what we're going to do is we're going to divide by the least moles. So we're going to divide by 0.577. So when you divide 1.155 divided by 0.577, that gives you 2.00. This gives you 1.00, and this gives you 4.00. So this tells us that our empirical formula is K2PO4. So we have an empirical formula. You guys can only kind of see because of the glare. So the question, in fact, asked about the molecular formula. So, but it gives us the molecular weight. So the molecular weight divided by the empirical weight gives us a whole round number that we can multiply our, co our subscripts by. 
So it is the molecular weight divided by the empirical weight So in this case, we're going to take our 520 out of the problem. And we're going to divide by the molecular weight or the empirical weight, which would be what we get when we total all these up, which is 173.17. That equals 3.0. So that tells us that our molecular formula is going to be K2 times 3. So we're going to have K6P3O12. And this would be our final answer. So what questions do we have about this example? We're going to try to make that a little bit even because it's kind of crooked. There you go. So do we have any questions? If you don't, you can always write none in the box. It helps me know. If you have any questions, you can ask them. Yeah. So Angela asks, can I explain how to get rid of a number like 1.33? Sure. I'm going to move it over here. So if by chance our K, P, and O, we add one mole here, two, and 1.33. Hypothetical answer is totally different. I only mildly think you guys can see that. Um, in this case. So... Here what we can see is that this 1.33 is also equal to 4 thirds. So the 4 thirds is basically turning it into a fraction. It will be fractions you know. So we cannot see this. But let me make that a little bit bigger. So what I often say is we multiply through by 3. And so when we multiply through by 3, when you multiply this, sorry, when you multiply by 3, it cancels that out to where you would get a 4. And the 2 times 3 would give you 6. And 1 times 3 will give you 3. To where in this case, with no previous mass, Math, you would get K4, P6, O3, and that would get rid of that. So I hope that helps. Angela, did this assist you in answering that question? It's totally fine to be like, not at all, and I'll try a different way. So David asks, can you put the answer as K6, P043? In this case, you could, mostly because you would recognize that it was a phosphate ion. Um, in many of these cases, you would not. If you can recognize it, you can. Be careful about putting those in, putting in parentheses because it's always possible that it's not a real element or not a phosphate ion. But in that case, yes, that would have been a K6PO. That. That would have worked. All right. Looks like we are doing pretty well. If there are no other questions, we will. Now I've moved all my things all over the place. Hold up. We will move to the atomic weight calculation. I'm sorry, y'all are getting like a bird, bird's eye view of my face. But that's okay. So. You guys can read the problem and start working. I'm going to erase the boards. Just taking a little longer today. The erasers are no good.
So in our next e question, question number three, so we're doing these way out of order. But this says that the atomic weight of gallium is 69.723, and there are two isotopes, gallium-69 and gallium-71. The gallium-69 isotope has an atomic weight of 68.925 and accounts for 60.108% of all gallium. What is the atomic mass and abundance of the other isotope? Move that back out of the way. So in atomic mass, let's think about, before we solve this, how do you do this calculation? Because that's an important first step. So atomic mass, is equal to the sum of the isotope mass multiplied by the fractional abundance. And this is for all isotopes. So sometimes I've asked for the atomic mass and given you the isotopes. In this example, I gave you the atomic mass and only one of the two isotopes. So let's think about what this means. So first up, we have 69.723 is our atomic mass. Our two isotopes are gallium-69 and gallium-71. So the question asks for two parts, the abundance and the mass. The abundance is relatively simple to calculate. So the abundance is going to be 100 minus the other isotope. And so the other isotope in this case is 60.108%. So the gallium-71 isotope is 39.892% abundant. Part one. So the reason we can do 100 minus the 60. 108 is because we know that there are only two isotopes and they must equal 100%. So we can basically say if there are 100% of things, we know that 60.108% is isotope 1. The remaining must be isotope 2. So then it's going to equal 68.925 atomic mass units times the fractional abundance, which is 0.60108. Plus the mass abundance times 0.39892. So then we can solve for it would be, let's do all the math today. So what we would get here is 41.429. So when we subtract 67.723 minus 41.429, we would get 27.844 equals x times 0.39892. The atomic mass of this isotope would be 69.789. I think there's a math error in here. Hold, please. Please ignore everything that just happened. I'm not, I think I plugged everything into my calculator wrong. It's kind of hard to say. But we should have gotten that 28.292 
is 69.24. This minus that gives us 28.292 multiplied by x, 0.39892. So 28.292 divided by 0.39892 gives us that the isotope abundance in this case is 70.921 atomic mass units. So if you are following along, you'll notice that I had an answer here that I boxed, which I said was my final answer, and I've erased that. Um, I'm not really sure what I plugged in wrong to my calculator, but I did. So this is the correct answer for gallium-71 in the isotope, mass and abundance. So what questions do we have, and if you have none, write none, about this calculation? So Ms. J asks, where did this come from? This number is 69.723 minus 41.429 gives you this. Why did we subtract what's on the left? So in this case, you are provided the atomic mass in the problem, but only the information about one isotope. So for those of you that are getting So I have an answer. Dang it. Y'all are right. So this is a four. This becomes a five. You are all correct. So I would like to vow that I actually check my, my answer keys multiple times on an exam. So don't. I know that it doesn't look like I can do math, but I would like to apologize for getting that one wrong multiple times. But you are correct that the answer is 70.925. What is happening? So other questions about this, although I will say some of it, I think you guys are not trimming your sig fig numbers here as you guys think about it. Other questions, otherwise it looks like we will have time to finish all of the other questions that I planned. So there are three left and I think the next one we will do is a density question. While you guys tell me if you have any other questions, um, before I erase all of this. 
So if you don't, if you followed along, then we will move on to calculating the amount of osmium that correlates to this. Angela would like to know if on the exam, do we have to know the dates and scientists that found the parts of the atom? Everything that we have talked about or watched videos on is fair game. So typically, I'm not a big fan of dates, but you should be able to replicate any of the atomic atom models that we've talked about. I hope that helps. Doesn't look like we have any more questions about this. So we will move to the next. So in our next question, it says, I can't read because I stuck it under my slides. So osmium has a density of 22.6 grams per cubic centimeter. What volume in milliliters is occupied by a 20.8 gram sample of osmium? So density equals mass over volume. So what it gave us is the density and the mass. And so we want to be able to calculate the volume. So we know that we have the density, which is 22.6 grams per mil. So we're going to take our 21.8 gram sample, divide by the density, which is 22.6 grams in one milliliter, and that gives us 0 0.965 milliliters. Like. So, hi, it is definitely the 2.1 video. Um, the atom models where we talked about the nucleus, the discovery of the electrons, the Rutherford model, it's definitely 2.1. Hopefully you guys watched it because I liked that video. I thought it went well. So any questions about this density calculation with osmium? I guess it would help if I moved out of the way. Otherwise, we will move to we have a unit conversion and a naming question, which will take us about to the end. Also, if you have exam questions, um, you can try to drop them in the chat. I will answer as many of those as I can. Um, I will stick around for a little bit after 4.15 if you have questions. Oh, Catherine asks, it says grams per cubic centimeter, but I just changed that to grams per mil. So one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. So I personally tend to make those two things like just move back and forth. You can do a unit conversion. You could have said that 22.6 grams per cubic centimeter, one cubic centimeter is one milliliter. So the density is also 22.6 grams per mil. So those cubic centimeters and milliliters are the same. So you don't need to convert those back and forth. Good question. Any other questions about this one? More? I think I can figure out how to put two up there at once. Nope. So it doesn't look like you guys have any questions. So, but just in case, we will read the next one and kind of think about it. So a research student weighs out 5.46 milligrams. What is the weight in micrograms? So a lot of times students want to use ways where you can basically just move the decimal place around, which is an acceptable option. Personally, I find that you guys can only do that if you start at meters or grams. Moving from micrograms to milligrams is often quite difficult. So here's how I think about that. So 
So we're going to take our 5.46 milligrams. And then I'm going to convert to grams and then to micrograms. So the way I think about it is that there are 1,000 milligrams in one gram. There are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. In one gram, there are 1 times 10 to the 6 micrograms. So I like whole numbers. I do not like negative exponents. That is a me decision. You are not required to feel the same. So what I do is I put my 1,000 milligrams and one gram. So now we've converted to grams. And in one gram, there are one times 10 to the six micrograms. So in 5.46 milligrams, there are 5,460 micrograms or 5.46 times 10 to the 10 to the third micrograms. So you can do this. There are a lot of different ways you could do this calculation. This is just the way I think about this calculation. So you can do the thing where you write it out and you move the decimal place here, there, and everywhere. It's just not how I think about it. This is how I like to think about it. So any questions about this? Or we'll look at our last question, which is naming which everyone likes to name compounds. But it looks like you guys are done with Osmium and Yahtzee. We'll just move these over so you guys can kind of see them at the same time. So if you don't have any questions, you can start working on that one. Sorry, get a little confused. Um, if you do have questions, I'll be, I'll hang out for another couple seconds to answer any about this one. So Ms. J, UG will always be MG. You probably can't see, but this is an M and this is the micro symbol. So micrograms is different than milligrams. And Zahara asks that we have to have sig figs. Sig figs always 100% of the time. Both of these answers have the same number of sig figs. So Ms. J, I don't think I answered your question mostly because I'm not quite sure what you're asking. So micrograms to milligrams are two different conversions. And just make sure that you're looking at the mu symbol or the m symbol. Both of those could be milla or micro. Good question. Well, maybe a good question. So, do you have any other questions? Doesn't look like you guys have other questions about this, which is great. Probably means we're all moving along. Yes. UG is micrograms. MG is milligrams. So Angela asks, isn't, I think I can do this. Yeah. Oh, well, that, no one can see that. Hold on. So Angela and several of you have asked, isn't micrograms 10 to the negative 6? So Megan says, yes. I could have sworn someone else said yes. So yes and no. So one microgram equals one times 10 to the negative six grams. That is true. But I wrote that one gram is one times 10 to the positive six micrograms. So you can actually do these in either direction. They will give you similar answers. So you do not have to use the negative six. If you try to do it my way and you use the negative six, you would not get this answer, which is not the right answer. So one microgram is 
basically one one hundred thousandth of a gram. But what this is also saying is that one times 10 to the sixth micrograms equal one gram. These are the same conversion. I just don't like negative exponents. So you can use this as long as you're not trying to recreate this work because then you would have had to switch these two to have one microgram and one times 10 to the negative six, which should give you the exact same answer. Does that make sense? So over the next, oh, it's 4.15. Um, if you guys have any questions, drop them in the box. I will go ahead and answer these. I think there's eight names so that you can have them for your reference. If you have to jet off, this will be saved onto my live stream. Um, the, you can access that from the lectures and reviews. It'll be titled Exam 1 Review Session. So if you have to go, you can go. Otherwise, okay. So for the next several questions, it asks, what are the names or components of these? So A is calcium carbonate. So calcium is Ca2 plus, carbonate is CO3 2 minus, so that gives you CaCO3. So the next one is nickel 2 chloride. The Roman numeral 2 tells you it's 2 plus. The chloride ion based on the periodic table is Cl minus, which tells us that it is NiCl2. So this, the Roman numeral 2 tells us it's a 2 plus ion. 3, I mean C. It's NaNO2. So that is Na is sodium. NO2 is nitrite, so that just tells you that the charge on the nitrite ion is going to be minus 1, because we can assume that this is balanced. D is silicon dioxide, so that is Si minus 2. O2 plus, so it's, it also tells us that it's dioxide, which is SiO2. We didn't talk a lot about the numerical prefixes, but this is how you would use that. E is MnO2. So we know that that's manganese. Now it asks for the charge and then it's oxide. So the O's each have a negative two. There's two of them, so that's gonna give you manganese four oxide. So the next one is F for ethanol. So in the chapter two part three video, I think, it tells you you have to basically memorize eight organic compounds for um, methane, ethane, propane, butane, as well as all of their alcohols, methanol, ethanol, propanol, and butanol. I don't think it includes pentanol, but trust that. So ethanol is C2H5OH. And so G, our last one, is C3H8 is propanol. So if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and answer, ask them. I will, be, I will stick around for another couple minutes. If you don't have questions, that's great. That's all of the questions that there were in the doc. So this will serve as the key. So Nicole asks, could we also name it manganese for dioxide? No. So the dioxide or trioxide or any of that is only for two non-metal compounds. And because manganese is a metal, it doesn't need to use the oxide portion. 
how did we know O2 was oxide? So, Ms. J, when oxygen is an anion, it's oxide. So if you're asking how did we know that O on this one, are you asking if it was the manganese peroxide? Yes. Camillo, you are definitely correct. I'm so sorry about that. Um, can you explain E again? Yes. So manganese oxide. So we know that MN is manganese. We know that there are two oxygens. And this is, we know that each of these is a negative 2 charge. So 2 times O2 minus gives us a 4 minus charge, which tells us that this has to contain a 4 plus charge to negate this charge. Now, which hopefully you can kind of see what that was. Um, so if when you think about some people want to use the O2 as peroxide, and it turns out that that is a different component, even though we often see it in some of these. And peroxides are super rare and actually never show up in this way. So other questions that you guys have today. Hopefully your studying is going well. Try to hit up the SI session because I think that will be really helpful. She has one tomorrow night from 6 to 7 and on Wednesday at, I think, at 12. Sounds about right. Any other questions today? It doesn't look like. You guys are going to do great. The exam is, these are the base skills. So if you can do a lot of these, you should be okay on the exam. It will be more questions than this. It will take It'll take the whole 75 minutes, but you got this. I have faith in all of you. Do you guys need anything else? Otherwise, if you have any more questions, I will see you guys not on Wednesday. On Wednesday, you'll take a test, but I will see you in 10 days. Y'all have a fantastic rest of your day. I'm happy to help. I hope this gave you some study tips and tricks. Good luck on the exam, guys.